We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, welcome by the way. If this is your first time at ACC, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor. I would love to meet you after service. I usually hang out in the lobby or the parking lot somewhere. Let's bump fists or shake hands or hug or something, all right? So come find me. You're actually here in the middle of a series we're doing called I Will Build My Church. It's based on a quote from Jesus that we see in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So this thing that we're doing right now as believers gather together, this is this concept that Jesus was talking about back in this verse. He said, I'm going to start this thing called the church, and I'm going to grow it, and I'm going to build it. And 2,000 years from now, there's going to be people who gather together for the purposes of the church. I'll teach you a fancy word. It's ecclesiology, right? Ecclesiology is the study of the church. And this series, we're looking at when Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, what was he talking about? What is it that we're a part of? What is it that we're called to, to be a part of? And I'll tell you that word uh, ecclesiology, it comes from this word ecclesia, which means called out ones or an assembly of God's people. So have you ever thought, have you ever heard someone say to you before that you are the church? Have you ever heard someone say that before? I want you to know that when you are by yourself, you are not the church. <laughs> All right, someone lied to you. It takes you and another brother or sister in Christ to come in together. You get two or three gathered together. That's, uh, you, you get a whole body gathered together, and we are the church. It's a gathering of believers. And so we're exploring this concept together of what a church looks like. In the book of Ephesians, which if you're not real familiar with God's word, you'll find that it's one of Paul's letters in the New Testament, so towards the last uh, quarter of your, your Bible, you're going to find three illustrations, three kind of uh, things that Paul is writing about when he's writing to the church in Ephesus. He's saying, listen, there's three things I want you to think about when you think of what a church is supposed to look like. The first thing we've already studied last week was a family. The church is supposed to look like a family. You probably remember this verse from last week, Ephesians 2.19. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. Here it is. You are members of God's family. So if you're a brother, if you're a follower of Christ in here, you are a brother or sister in Christ. We are family together. And the church is called to look like and operate like a family. If you missed last week's message... We got your back, right? Go on to YouTube or Facebook and watch that, and we'll, I'll tell you more about what that looks like. Another one of the symbols that we see in Scripture is a symbol of a building or a structure. Another illustration that Paul uses, if you want to know what a church is supposed to look like, it's going to look a lot like a building. Or a, uh, Think about this for a moment. If you go out into a field and you see a brick sitting there, right? You don't look at it and think, well, I wonder what this building is, <laughs> right? No, you just see a brick sitting there all by itself. It's just a brick. But when you take a bunch of bricks and you put them together with some sort of intentionality and purpose, you're going to create a building. You're going to create a structure. And we actually see this if we keep reading in Ephesians after 19, uh, 2, 19, it says in verse 20, together, there it is. This doesn't work if you're by yourself. Together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. And we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, 
You Gentiles are also being made part of, the, of, his, of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. You've probably heard someone say before that the church is like the house of God, right? This is the house of God. Well, where does that come from? It comes from this verse right here. When, when we as believers recognize that we are individual bricks, but that we're not meant to be scattered about, we're meant to be put together with intentionality and purpose, it says right there at the end that when we're all made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. I love in this verse how, by the way, you see the Trinity. You see a part, you see God the Father, you see God the Son, you see the Holy Spirit all working together. I think we would all agree that there's a very big difference between a pile of bricks or even bricks scattered about and bricks that have been put together with a purpose. And so when you think about what is the church supposed to look like, it's supposed to look like bricks that have been put together with intentional purpose. And so that really leads us to the part we're going to talk about today. I told you there were three illustrations. There's the church family, and then this building or structure illustration. And then the one we're going to talk about today is a church body. And when I say body, I, I mean like a physical body. This illustration that Paul uses saying the church, if it's acting and functioning properly, it's going to kind of resemble what a body looks like and how a body works. If you want to know what a healthy body is versus an unhealthy body, you can kind of study that and figure out what does a healthy church look like and an unhealthy church church look like? Let me show you, uh, if you remember a verse from two weeks ago, we read in Ephesians 4, verse 3, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Remember, we were talking about a church unified, that we're supposed to make an effort to actually have a, a, a love amongst us, a, a peace of, uh, a, a bound together by a bond of peace. But why? Like, what, what's the purpose of that? Why do we want that? If you keep reading in Ephesians 4, the next verse in verse 4, it says, in fact, I want to play a game with you, all right? You guys want to play a game? I'm going to read this verse, but what I need is every time the word one, O-N-E, pops up on the screen, I want you to say it with me out loud, all right? And then someone uh, sir, will you help me? I just need you to count how many times we say the word, all right? Just keep, keep track, all right? Here we go. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. How many do we got? Seven. Seven times in this, how many verses? It's uh, four, five, and six. We have this word one. Listen, we are called as part of this concept of being a church body, united, held together through this bond of peace. We are called to oneness. We're called to be together, to be connected, to, to be functioning together as, as one. In 1 Corinthians 12, which is, by the way, the other primary passage we're going to be looking at today. So Ephesians, there's a few scattered about. And then if 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, it says, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Now, why do we call it Christ's body? Because, well, we're going to find out. There's, there's a reason we call this body his body. But let me first ask you, if you walked into a room and you saw body parts scattered about in the room, what would you call that? That's a crime scene, right? Like you would immediately grab your phone and call 911 and say something has gone horribly wrong in this room, right? We recognize that we're not supposed to have, see body parts disconnected from each other because that would be a, a crime, right? That would be terrible. I want you to know the same is true within the church. Like, what do you call a church that is a, a church, I got to put some air quotes up on that, with scattered Christians? I, I argue that it's the exact same answer. That's a crime scene. That's not the way the church was meant to, was not designed to function. In fact, if you have scattered Christians here and there, that's not even a church, right? Because a church requires 
this concept of being bound together to be part of this body. And I, I want to explore that with you more. What is this one body thing that we're supposed to be a part of? First Corinthians goes on and talks about how we've been each given different gifts from God, which is more evidence of his grace, that he's just given us things that we don't deserve. And he's given those things to accomplish this purpose that we have as a church, which is called the Great Commission. Let, let me uh, read this, another passage for you out of Ephesians 4. If we keep reading. It says, this will continue. Let me, let me tell you what this is. What is this thing that will continue? The need for the church to be bound together The need for the church to be operating in oneness. The need for the church to fulfill this purpose of of the great commission of making disciples. All of this stuff is what Paul's talking about here. All of this will continue until, you ready for this? We all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Let me give you the Matt International version of this verse. You ready? All right, this is a very loose paraphrase, all right? The need for the church to exist in oneness, to be operating as the body of Christ, doing the things that the church was designed to do, all of those things will continue and need to continue until pigs fly. I mean, you read a verse like this and it says, listen, until the church measures up to the full and complete standard of Christ, that's not going to happen on this side of heaven. As long as there's still uh, the natural world and God hasn't come and put an end to this and started something fresh, listen, all of us are going to be still working towards this goal, which means the need for the church isn't going away. It's not like, hey, if we could just accomplish, you know, our church's vision, right, is to see people transformed and released by the love of Jesus. You know what I love about that vision? We're never going to fully get there. There's always someone else who needs to be transformed and released by the love of Jesus. Our church has a lot of work to do. And so all this kind of culminates, and we're talking about this body illustration in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, if you have a copy of God's Word, If you would open up and look at this for yourself, underline it. We're going to spend the rest of the morning talking about Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. And if you don't own a Bible, by the way, this is the best book you'll ever own. And so you own one, all right? Grab grab one from underneath the chair in front of you. Write your name in it. Take it with you. We don't have like library alarm sounds that go off when you leave. Take it with you, okay? Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. This is a culmination of this body illustration. It says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who, by the way, is the head of the body. Let's talk about that in a second. The church. And then he says, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. We'll talk about that in a second. And then it says, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So that, those two verses are going to be our roadmap, all right? If you've got your note sheet in front of you, first I want to make two really powerful observations. It starts off in verse 15. It reminds us that Jesus is the head of the church. He's in charge. He calls all the shots. Listen, the lead pastor is not the head of the church. And I answer to a board of overseers, a board of elders. They are not the head of the church. They certainly can help and cast vision and provide budgets and all that stuff. But they answer to Jesus, who is the head of the church. If Jesus says do it, the church should do it. If Jesus says don't do it, the church should not do it. Jesus is in charge of this place. I love pastoring this church because I know with all my heart that Jesus is the head of this place. And so Jesus being the head of the church, what happens when you cut the head off of something? It dies, right? I remember someone telling me that, that when you cut the head off of a chicken, that it eventually dies, but it doesn't happen immediately. And I, I thought as I was writing this week, I'm like, I wonder if that's really true. So I YouTubed it. I don't recommend this YouTube search, okay? It's actually very true. For about 45 seconds, 
this chicken, right? Just flapping around, running around in circles, has no head, okay, mind you. And head is gone, it is about for 45 seconds, and then they'll finally, it just kind of sits down, it's like, all right, I, I quit. I can't find it. I don't know. I don't know It's looking for it or what. But I will tell you, there are a lot of churches in the United States of America that are operating, they're flapping around, they're spinning around chaotically, trying to find something. I don't know what's going on, but the reason why is because Jesus is no longer the head of the church. And so it's really important to understand that we, as a healthy church, Jesus always has to be in charge. And what he says goes. If it's in this book, we're going to do it. The second illustration I want to make from verse 15 is that it says that Jesus makes everything fit together perfectly. Jesus has a purpose for every part. Have any of you ever done like one of the larger puzzles, like a thousand piece puzzle? Any of you love puzzles? Anyone have a hobby of puzzles in here? All right, I've probably done like a thousand piece puzzle. We did it as a family, like on vacation. I didn't really enjoy it that much, but we did it. Uh, have you ever done like a 2,000 piece puzzle? I, I was doing some research to figure out like how big, how many pieces are actually available. There, on, on Amazon, you can find a 5,000 piece puzzle for $80. You can find a, a 33,000 piece puzzle on Amazon for $450. I can't imagine why anyone would want to do that. <clears throat> or how big of a room you would need in your house to be able to pull that off or how small those pieces are, I don't know. But can you imagine a puzzle with multiple billion pieces? Now we live in a world with eight billion people, supposedly half of the people profess to be Christians. I'm sure most of those people are just saying, I grew up in a Christian home, I don't really know what that means. So they say they're Christians. So let's just say about 25% of the world actually has made a decision to follow Jesus. That's multiple billion pieces, and according to Paul, Who's, who's writing the inspired word of God, every one of those pieces has a place and is meant, it fits perfectly together if the church body is functioning in health. That's pretty cool. There is a place for every believer in the church. Every single Christian has been carefully designed to fit and so that leads us to our, our three-part roadmap when you look at verse 16. 16, really, verse 16 shows you what does it require to be a healthy church body? What does a healthy body do? The first step, all right, if you're taking notes, some of those fill in the blank. Step one is first, each part of the body does its part in the body. That's step number one. If you want to be a healthy, if we want to be a healthy body here at Arundel Christian Church, each part, every believer who's part of this body has got to do their part in the body. That's what, that's what it says in Ephesians 4, 16. It says, as each part does its own special work. That's the precursor. The rest of it's not going to make sense unless we get this part right. Each part has to do its part. The plan only works efficiently when when that's the way it works. We have uh, an, uh, kind of a, a way that we remember that around here. We call it shape. If you think about a puzzle piece, right, a thousand piece puzzle, every one of those puzzle pieces has a unique shape, right? There's no, unless you get one of the really cheap puzzles where they're all the same shape. That sounds miserable to me, but uh, in a really good puzzle, every piece has a unique shape. Well, every piece of God's puzzle, called the church body, has a unique shape. And there's, the way to remember that is S-H-A-P-E, right? The S stands for spiritual giftedness. The Bible teaches that when you give your life to Jesus, one of the, listen, you receive the greatest gift of all is the, this, this relation, restored relationship you have with God the Father. That's the best gift. But because God's so gracious along with it, he also wants to help you help other people learn about this incredible gift. So he gives you these things called spiritual gifts. 
Some people he gives one. Some people maybe he gives two or three. And there's certain seasons in life where he might actually give you one temporarily or give you one in abundance. And, but these spiritual gifts are gifts that you receive through the Holy Spirit that God gives you, all right? We're gonna talk more about those in a moment. The H in shape stands for heart. And the way to remember this is we're each passionate. Our heart kind of beats a little faster when we hear about certain topics, doesn't it? You might be really passionate about clean water in the world, wanting to make sure everyone has something they can drink without getting sick. Maybe you're really passionate about sex trafficking, or you're really passionate about poverty, or you're really passionate about, there's just certain things that when you hear these issues, you see the commercial, the person next to you is like, eh, and you're like, I got a call, I got to be a part of this. It's because you have a passion there for something, right? That's the, the P. The A stands for ability, abilities. God has given each one of us in this room multiple different things that we're good at. Maybe, I'll give you some examples. Maybe you're really good at singing. Maybe you're really good at dancing. Maybe you're really good at digging. Maybe you're good at like computers and technological things. Maybe you're good at, you know, I don't know. There's all sorts of incredible gifts that we have in this room. If we were to just go person by person, we'd have them all covered because God's created this puzzle to fit together perfectly. We all have a, uh, these different abilities. The uh, S-H-A-P, right, stands for personality. Each of us in this room, again, we have a slightly different personality than anyone else in this room. Some obvious examples, right? We have introverts in this room. We have extroverts in this room. Well, guess what? God gave you that personality for a reason because he has roles within the church where he's like, I have some places where I need some introverts, I have some places where I need every time a car drives in this place, I need them waving and acting goofy. I need some extroverts. There's personalities that are different. And then the last one is E, which stands for experiences. And these aren't just the, the positive experiences. These are negative experiences, all of your experiences of life. Maybe you've experienced a divorce. Well, how can God use that experience to help you be a part of the body of Christ in encouraging other people who are going through the same thing. Maybe you've experienced the death of a loved one. Well, you know, there are other people in this building right now that are grieving. And your experience could be an encouragement to them. Maybe you have had a really great experience. Maybe you started a business from scratch and you know what it looks like to grow that thing. And, and there's other people right now who are at an earlier stage in that process. And boy, could you be a huge help in the body of Christ. You see, S-H-A-P-E, all of us in this room, we are a uniquely uh, designed puzzle piece in this body of Christ that God is creating and everyone has a part. Let me read a verse to you out of Romans. Romans 12, verses three through five says, because of the privilege and authority that God has given me, this is Paul writing to the church in, in Rome, the churches in Rome, he says, I give each of you this warning. Don't think that you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given to us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. You know, it would be weird if your foot to try, tried to do all the seeing for your body, right? It hasn't been equipped to do that. It's important for us to know what has, how has God shaped me uniquely? What are my gifts? What are the experiences? What, and we gotta be honest with ourselves. I'll give you an example. As a pastor, right, there's a whole list of things that pastors are supposed to be pretty good at. Well, I can look at that list and say, I think I'm pretty good at some things. Like, I think I'm a pretty good communicator. But then I look at like shepherding and I realize that's one of my weaknesses. I'm not very good at, at coming alongside people as they're telling me about their feelings. I'm like, I'm more of a fact person, right? Just tell me what's real. Don't tell me how you feel. And so when I know that about myself, I got two options. I either got to surround myself with people who are really good at that kind of stuff, or I've got to, I mean, it's usually a both and, I got to learn to grow in that area. And so when we are honest with ourselves, we can say, well, what am I good at? What am I not good at? Where do I need to? And we all figure out that God's put us together for a reason because we help each other out. That's what a church body's supposed to do. 
And then it says there at the end of that verse that we all belong to each other. Have you ever seen that before? It actually says that when you become a follower of Christ, you belong as part of the body, you belong to the other parts of the body. The other parts of the body own you. You belong to them. You're part of each other. What that means is that when we look at how God has shaped us, that he's given us these gifts not for ourselves, but for others. And I want to show you what that looks like in the next step of our Ephesians 4, 16. So if we want to be a healthy church, step one, remember each part of the body has to do its part in the body. So that leads to step two. Each part of the body then helps the other body parts grow. If we look at that verse again, 4.16, it says, as each part does its own special work, the next part, here's what we're talking about now, it helps the other parts grow. How many of you have been on so many airplane flights that you don't even pay attention to the safety protocol speech at the beginning anymore, right? You know what they're going to say, you know how to put your seatbelt on, you know the mask stuff and that there's exits and that you're just, if there's a fire, you run, right? You know, like, that's probably not what you're supposed to do, but... One of the things they tell you during that, that little thing, right, is that if a mask comes down, it just basically means that the pressure inside the cabin has changed so much that the oxygen level is going to be off enough that you, you have, you're at risk of passing out unless you get this mask on your face. And so they tell you to make sure that you put your own mask on first before you put a mask on your children, your spouse, or anyone else that you love that's around you, right? Before you worry about the people around you, make sure you get your own mask on. Well, I don't know about you, but I think about that, and I'm like, that sounds really selfish. Like, if someone's going to die here, I want it to be me, not my kids, so I'm going to put their mask on first. But here's the reason why they actually say that, is what's, what you're at risk of happening is, is passing out, and then possibly after that, dying of not enough oxygen, right? So they say, listen, get your mask on so that you're conscious, so that you're awake, and then you can help the people around you. That's exactly this order of operations. God's word says, if we're gonna be a healthy body, first, you need to use the gift that God has given you. And then when you use the gifts that God has given you, you're gonna be in a place where you can then help other people grow. You got to start with making sure that you are awake and conscious so that you can help other people wake up and become conscious. 1 Corinthians 12, if we keep reading in verse, 1 Corinthians 12, it says in verse 7, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can make much of ourselves. Now, some of you are paying attention, right? That's not what it says. It says spiritual gifts have been given to us so that what? We can help each other. The reason that God has given you a unique shape is not so you can make much of your name. It's so you can make much of his name. It's so you can help other people around you, right? The two greatest commandments, love God and love people. That's why God gave you these gifts. So you can love God with them and you can love other people with them. And then it goes on. I'm gonna read from verse eight all the way through verse 11. All right, bear with me. It says to To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. And it says he gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person person should have. You know what's interesting is you read through some of these spiritual gifts. These are the gifts that you receive when you uh, give your life to Christ and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, it comes along with these gifts, right? When you read this list of gifts, do you know what they all have in common? They have all been given to you to help other people grow. They've been given to you so that other people can benefit. You think about this with wise advice, giving a, a knowledge, a, a message of special knowledge, having contagious faith, having the gift of healing or speaking someone else's language, all of these gifts are not for you to make much of you. 
They're for you that when you use your shape, your unique giftedness that God has given to you, you can help other people grow. And by the way, 1 Corinthians 12, I wish I had time to go through the whole chapter, but I don't. So would you guys do me a favor and put your bookmark there and spend some time reading that chapter today? If not today, make sure to, to read it tomorrow. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 will re-highlight all the things we're talking about this morning. It goes on to say that the body has many different parts and that all of them are important. Have you ever felt unimportant in the body of Christ? Have you ever felt like if you disappeared and just kind of went off and did your own thing that no one would really care and the church would continue to be healthy without you? You know, there are certain parts of our body, our physical body, called vestigial organs. These are the organs that the... uh, I wrote it down so I would say it right, the name of this organization. Medical Journals. That's what I wrote down. (laughs) Trust me, okay? (laughs) So Medical Journals have a list of 40 parts that at one point in the past were deemed useless. They were called vestigial organs. And the the way the medical science would try to explain it, they would lean into the whole concept of evolution and say, well, well, at some point your body needed this thing, but through the process of evolution, you now no longer need that. Uh, Our water's clean now, and the air's clean now, and this, and whatever, whatever, and you don't longer need this thing anymore. Um, So go ahead and just cut it out if you want to. Well, believe it or not, as, as science improves and more and more things go into understanding the organs in our bodies, even the body parts that, yeah, you can technically go in and take your appendix out. That's one of the vestigial organs. You can cut it out. They used to just say it's useless. You don't need it anymore. Just cut it out. You can survive without your appendix, right? How many of you don't have your appendix, all right? Some of you got it out at some point, right? You're here. You know, so you, there, there you go. I just proved a point. You can live without it, but they've actually proven now that your appendix and all the other vestigial organs actually do serve a purpose. And when you take them out, your body will be a little bit less healthy, or you'll have to take some supplement or something else to make up for the fact that you don't have that organ anymore. I want you to know that some of you in this room, you might feel like a vestigial organ. But every single part of the body of Christ exists for a purpose. Every part fits perfectly together in the body of Christ. If we keep reading 1 Corinthians 15 or 12, verse 25 and 26, it says, This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Have you noticed that our body, our physical body, does a really good job? Uh, if, 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 like, you sprain an ankle and your ankle swells up, you know what's really happening is your body says, okay, a part of our body is injured. We want to now do whatever we can to get that part of our body healthy. So your body's going to give up a, some of the blood. It's going to send some white blood cells down in that way. You're going to get like a swell. You're going to get some things because your body's trying to repair the part that's injured. Because the body recognizes, listen, if that one part is injured, it's going to affect all of us. If he just walks around, if Matt has this injured ankle for the rest of his life, we're not going to move as fast as we'd like to as a whole body. We want to get to where we need to go, so let's all give up a little some of our resources and try to fix this ankle. The same is true in the body of Christ. We take care of our brothers and sisters. When someone's injured, it affects us all. I want you to know, especially about sin, you know, your sin affects everybody. You might have convinced yourself that your sin only affects you. That's not the way the body works. And when there's one part who just goes MIA, I'll tell you, there's certain tasks in this church that God has two people designed for this task. And one of the people is like, I don't want to do it. So the other part is making up for it. And that person's getting burned out at this very moment. They're working on all cylinders. They're showing up every Sunday. They're wishing, why is there not someone else coming to take part of this load? Because the body is going to keep functioning. But at the end, you're actually hurting the body. I want you to ask yourself three really hard questions before we wrap up this morning. 
Here's the questions I want you to ask yourself. Am I using my gifts, my unique shape to serve the church? And let me put that a little bit more poignant. I'm going to, like, I'm already stepping on your toe, but now I'm going to, like, lean into it a little bit and go like this. All right, here we go. You ready? Am I a consumer or am I a participant? See, for a lot of us, Sunday mornings is this season where, you know, this day of the week where you come and you consume. I, I get fed through this worship. I, I hear this message. I get to be up. I get to see baptism. It's so cool. It fills me up. And then you leave and you come back next week to consume more. When God's word says, listen, there's a part of the body that you are meant to be playing. There's a role here for you and you are just taking a third question, are you making much of you with the shape that God has given to you, or are you making much of God with the shape that God has given to you? Here, here's step three. In the same verse, we see that it, first each part does its own part in the body, and then each part of the body then helps other parts grow, and that leads to step three. Each part of the body can then be part of a healthy body. <laughs> As each part does its own thing, and then they help other parts grow, then all those parts then get to be a part of a body that is healthy. Ephesians 4, 16, the last part of that verse, it says, as each part does its own special work, that's step one, it helps the other parts grow, that's step two, so that, step three, the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Notice in this verse, it goes, it starts with me, like it starts with the individual, and then it goes to you, how can I help you, and then it ends with we, as I help myself use my gifts and then I help you learn how to grow in your gifts, then we as a whole body get to be healthy and full of love. You know, this church is, can only be as strong as its weakest link. You've probably heard that phrase before, right? You have a big long chain and you're trying to lift something, you're only gonna be able to lift as much as the weakest link on that chain can handle. And so here's my favorite thing about Arundel Christian Church. I love that this church, when I study what a healthy church body looks like, I could say with confidence, we are a healthy church body. I look at how ACC is known as healthy. We're growing. We're full of love. And all that I say, amen, hallelujah. I'm so excited to pastor a church like that. But listen, we still have a lot of work to do. There are still a lot of consumers in this church. There are a lot of people who are, are coming in and taking, taking, taking when God's calling you to give and participate and be a part and connected to stop. I don't want to ever witness a crime scene in this church. I don't want to see a body functioning, working together, accomplishing the purpose that God has for us. So as we always wrap up our messages here, we ask the question to God, what now, God? What do you want us to do with this? And I have a, a, I don't know how often I'm allowed to play a pastor card, you know, like pull out my wallet and be like, all right, pastor, trump card, you got to do this. I said so, right? I don't, I know I don't really have that kind of authority in many of your, whatever. But listen, if I have anything, if I get to play a pastor card, here's where I'm going to play it right now. And it's this, if you are just consuming, I need you to start serving. If you are just a consumer around here, and this is your place, listen, if you're a visitor with us this morning, uh, we want you just to consume. We want you just to experience the love of Jesus this morning. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and you're just curious about Jesus, and you're exploring all this, listen, consume. We do all this. Uh, we, want you to, we want you to know about Jesus, all right? Just consume. But if you are a follower of Christ, brother or sister, you are part of the body. I need you to stop consuming and start participating. And maybe God will put on your heart what that, that is, how to do that. I listen, outside these doors, we have our next steps counter. You can say, listen, I, I, I want to serve. I don't know how. You can go on our website, arundelcc.org slash serve and tell us you want to serve and we'll get you plugged in. You know, there's a parable in scripture about a master who gives different talents to his servants and, and one of the, the servants buries that talent and doesn't use it. 
I encourage you to go read that parable and you will learn that that's not a good thing to do. God has given you these things. He's entrusted you with these gifts so that you can use them and invest them to build his church. He's building his church and he's using us. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we've had to open up your word and to study it and to look at what it says about a healthy church body. Help us all to be a part of what you're doing, God. We want to to not be consumers. We want to be participants. As you're working to to make disciples, God, you've given the, the church this great commission, which is to go out into all the world and make disciples. God, we we know that that's a huge task and it's gonna take all of us to roll up our sleeves and dive in and be a part of what you're doing. So help us to do that. God, thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.